Chapter 8 In which Sophie leaves the castle in several directions at once. To Sophie's relief, Calcifer blazed up bright and cheerful next morning. If she had not had enough of Howl, she would have been almost touched by how glad Howl was to see Calcifer. I thought she'd done for you, you old ball of gas, Howl said, kneeling at the hearth with his sleeves trailing in the ash. I was only tired, Calcifer said. There was some kind of drag on the castle. I'd never taken it that fast before. Well, don't let her make you do it again, said Hal. He stood up, gracefully brushing ash off his grey and scarlet suit. Make a start on that spell today, Michael. And if anyone comes from the king, I'm away on urgent private business until tomorrow. I'm going to see Letty, but you needn't tell him that. He picked up his guitar and opened the door with the knob green down onto the wide, cloudy hills. The scarecrow was there again. When Howl opened the door, it pitched sideways across him with its turnip face on his chest. The guitar uttered an awful twang. Sophie gave a faint squawk of terror and hung on to the chair. One of the scarecrow's stick arms was scraping stiffly round to get a purchase on the door. From the way Howl's feet were braced, it was clear he was being shoved quite hard. There was no doubt that the thing was determined to get into the castle. Calcifer's blue face leaned out of the grate. Michael stood stock still beyond. There really is a scarecrow, they both said. Oh, is there? Do tell, Hal panted. He got one foot up against the door frame and heaved. The scarecrow flew lumpishly away backward to land with a light rustle in the heather some yards off. It sprang up instantly and came hopping toward the castle again. Howl hurriedly laid the guitar on the doorstep and jumped down to meet it. No, you don't, my friend, he said with one hand out. Go back where you came from. He walked forward slowly, still with his hand out. The scarecrow retreated a little, hopping slowly and warily backward. When Howl stopped, the scarecrow stopped too, with its one leg planted in the heather and its ragged arms tilting this way and that, like a person sparring for an opening. The rags fluttering on its arms seemed a mad imitation of Howl's sleeves. So, you won't go, Howl said, and the turnip head slowly moved from side to side. No. I'm afraid you'll have to, Howl said. You scare Sophie, and there's no knowing what she'll do when she's scared. Come to think of it, you scare me too. Howl's arms moved heavily, as if he was lifting a large weight, until they were raised high above his head. He shouted out a strange word which was half hidden in a crack of sudden thunder, and the scarecrow went soaring away. Up and backward it went, rags fluttering, arms wheeling in protest, up and out and on and on, until it was a soaring speck in the sky, then a vanishing point in the clouds, and then not to be seen at all. Howell lowered his arms and came back to the doorway, mopping his face on the back of his hand. I take back my hard words, Sophie, he said, panting. That thing was alarming. It may have been dragging the castle back all yesterday. It had some of the strongest magic I've met. Whatever was it? All that was left of the last person you cleaned for? Sophie gave a weak little cackle of laughter. Her heart was behaving badly again. Hal realised something was wrong with her. He jumped indoors across his guitar, took hold of her elbow and sat her in the chair. Take it easy now. Something happened between Hal and Calcifer then. Sophie felt it, because she was being held by Hal, and Calcifer was still leaning out of the grate. Whatever it was, her heart began to behave properly almost at once. Howell looked at Calcifer, shrugged, 
and turned away to give Michael a whole lot of instructions about making Sophie keep quiet for the rest of the day. Then he picked up the guitar and left at last. Sophie lay in the chair and pretended to feel twice as ill as she did. She had to let Howe get out of sight. It was a nuisance he was going to upper folding as well, but she would walk so much more slowly that she would arrive around the time he started back. The important thing was not to meet him on the way. She watched Michael slyly while he spread out the spell and scratched his head over it. She waited until he dragged big leather books off the shelves and began making notes in a frantic, depressed sort of way. When he seemed properly absorbed, Sophie muttered several times, Stuffy in here. Michael took no notice. Terribly stuffy, Sophie said, getting up and shambling to the door. Fresh air. She opened the door and climbed out. Calcifer obligingly stopped the castle dead while she did. Sophie landed in the heather and took a look round to get her bearings. The road over the hills to Upper Folding was a sandy line through the heather just downhill from the castle. Naturally, Carcival would not make things inconvenient for Howell. Sophie set off toward it. She felt a little sad. She was going to miss Michael and Calcifer. She was almost at the road when there was shouting behind her. Michael came bounding down the hillside after her, and the tall black castle came bobbling along behind him, shedding anxious puffs of smoke from all four turrets. "'What are you doing?' Michael said when he caught up. From the way he looked at her, Sophie could see he thought the scarecrow had sent her wrong in the head. "'I'm perfectly all right,' Sophie said indignantly. "'I'm simply going to see my other sister's granddaughter. She's called Letty Hatter, too. Now do you understand?' "'Where does she live?' Michael demanded, as if he thought Sophie might not know. Upper folding, said Sophie. But that's over ten miles away, Michael said. I promised Howell I'd make you rest. I can't let you go. I told him I wouldn't let you out of my sight. Sophie did not look very kindly on this. Howell thought she was useful now because he wanted her to see the king. Of course, he did not want her to leave the castle. Huh, she said. Besides said Michael, slowly grasping the situation. Hal must have gone to Upper Folding, too. I'm quite sure he has, said Sophie. Then you're anxious about this girl, if she's your great niece, Michael said, arriving at the point at last. I see. But I can't let you go. I'm going, said Sophie. But if Hal sees you there, he'll be furious. Michael went on working things out, because I promised him he'll be mad with both of us. You ought to rest. Then, when Sophie was almost ready to hit him, he exclaimed, Wait! There's a pair of seven-league boots in the broom cupboard. He took Sophie by her skinny old wrist and towed her uphill to the waiting castle. She was forced to give little hops in order not to catch her feet in the heather. But, she panted, Seven leagues is twenty-one miles. I'd be halfway to Port Haven in two strides. No, it's ten and a half miles a step, said Michael. That makes upper folding almost exactly. If we each take one boot and go together, then I won't be letting you out of my sight and you won't be doing anything strenuous, and we'll get there before Hal does, so he won't even know we've been. That solves all our problems beautifully. Michael was so pleased with himself that Sophie did not have the heart to protest. She shrugged and supposed Michael had better find out about the two letters before they changed looks again. It was more honest this way. But when Michael fetched the boots from the broom cupboard, Sophie began to have doubts. Up to now, she had thought they were two leather buckets that had somehow lost their handles and then got a little squashed. "'You're supposed to put your foot in them, shoe and all,' Michael explained, as he carried the two heavy bucket-shaped things to the door. "'These are the prototypes of the boots Howl made for the King's army. 
we managed to get the later ones a bit lighter and more boot-shaped. He and Sophie sat on the doorstep and each put one foot in a boot. Point yourself toward upper folding before you put the boot down, Michael warned her. He and Sophie stood up on the foot, which was in an ordinary shoe, and carefully swung themselves round to face upper folding. Now, tread, said Michael. Zip! The landscape instantly rushed past them so fast it was only a blur. A grey-green blur for the land, and a blue-grey blur for the sky. The wind of their going tore at Sophie's hair and dragged every wrinkle in her face backward until she thought she would arrive with half her face behind each ear. The rushing stopped as suddenly as it had begun. Everything was calm and sunny. They were knee-deep in buttercups in the middle of Upper Folding Village Common. A cow nearby stared at them. Beyond it, thatched cottages drowsed under trees. Unfortunately, the bucket-like boot was so heavy that Sophie staggered as she landed. Don't put that foot down, Michael yelled. Too late. There was another zipping blur and more rushing wind. When it stopped, Sophie found herself right down the folding valley, almost into marsh folding. Oh, drat, she said, and hopped carefully round on her shoe and tried again. Zip! Blur! And she was back on upper folding green again, staggering forward with the weight of the boot. She had a glimpse of Michael diving to catch her. Zip! Blur! Oh, bother! wailed Sophie. She was up in the hills again. The crooked black shape of the castle was drifting peacefully nearby. Carcifer was amusing himself blowing black smoke rings from one turret. Sophie saw that much before her shoe caught in the heather and she stumbled forward again. Zip! Zip! This time Sophie visited, in rapid succession, the market square of Market Chipping and the front lawn of a very grand mansion. Blow! she cried. Drat! One word for each place and she was off again with her own momentum and another zip right down at the end of that valley in a field somewhere. A large red bull raised its ring nose from the grass and thoughtfully lowered its horns. I'm just leaving, my good beast, Sophie cried, hopping herself round frantically. Zip back to the mansion, zip to Market Square, zip, and there was the castle yet again. She was getting the hang of it. Zip, here was upper folding, but how did you stop? Zip! Oh, confound it! Sophie cried, almost in marsh folding again. This time, she hopped round very carefully and trod with great deliberation. Zip! And fortunately, the boot landed in a cow pat and she sat down with a thump. Michael sprinted up before Sophie could move and dragged the boot off her foot. Thank you, Sophie cried breathlessly. There seemed no reason why I should ever stop. Sophie's heart pounded a bit as they walked across the common to Mrs. Fairfax's house, but only in the way hearts do when you have done a lot rather quickly. She felt very grateful for whatever Howl and Culcifer had done. Nice place, Michael remarked, as he hid the boots in Mrs. Fairfax's hedge. Sophie agreed. The house was the biggest in the village. It was thatched with white walls between the black beams, and, as Sophie remembered from visits as a child, you walked up to the porch through a garden crowded with flowers and humming with bees. Over the porch, a honeysuckle and a white climbing rose were competing as to which could give most work to the bees. It was a perfect hot summer morning down here in Upper Folding. Mrs. Fairfax answered the door herself. She was one of those plump, comfortable ladies with swathes of butter-coloured hair coiled round her head who made you feel good with life just to look at her. Sophie felt just the tiniest bit envious of Letty. Mrs. Fairfax looked from Sophie to Michael. She had seen Sophie last a year ago as a girl of seventeen, and there was no reason for her to recognise her as an old woman of ninety. "'Good morning to you,' she said politely. Sophie sighed. Michael said, This is Letty Hatter's great aunt. I brought her here to see Letty. Oh, I thought the face looked familiar, Mrs. Fairfax exclaimed. There's quite a family likeness. Do come in.
Letty's a little bit busy just now, but have some scones and honey while you wait. She opened her front door wider. Instantly, a large collie dog squeezed past Mrs. Fairfax's skirts, barged between Sophie and Michael, and ran across the nearest flower bed, snapping off flowers right and left. Oh, stop him! Mrs. Fairfax gasped, flying off in pursuit. I don't want him out just now. There was a minute or so of helter-skelter chase in which the dog ran hither and thither, whining in a disturbed way, and Mrs. Fairfax and Sophie ran after the dog, jumping flower beds and getting in one another's way, and Michael ran after Sophie, crying, Stop! You'll make yourself ill! Then the dog set off, loping round one corner of the house. Michael realised that the way to stop Sophie was to stop the dog. He made a crosswise dash through the flower beds, plunged round the house after the dog, and seized it by two handfuls of its thick coat, just as it reached the orchard at the back. Sophie hobbled up to find Michael pulling the dog away backward and making such strange faces at her that she thought at first he was ill. But he jerked his head so often toward the orchard that she realised he was only trying to tell her something. She stuck her face round the corner of the house expecting to see a swarm of bees. Howl was there with Letty. They were in a grove of mossy apple trees in full bloom with a row of beehives in the distance. Letty sat in a white garden seat. Howl was kneeling on one knee in the grass at her feet, holding one of her hands and looking noble and ardent. Letty was smiling lovingly at him. But the worst of it, as far as Sophie was concerned, was that Letty did not look like Martha at all. She was her own extremely beautiful self. She was wearing a dress of the same kind of pinks and white as the crowded apple blossom overhead. Her dark hair trailed in glossy curls over one shoulder, and her eyes shone with devotion for Howl. Sophie brought her head back round the corner and looked with dismay at Michael holding the whining collie dog. He must have had a speed spell with him, Michael whispered, equally dismayed. Mrs. Fairfax caught them up, panting and trying to pin back a loose coil of her buttery hair. Bad dog, she said in a fierce whisper to the collie. I'll put a spell on you if you do that once more. The dog blinked and crouched down. Mrs. Fairfax pointed a stern finger. Into the house. Stay in the house. The collie shook himself free of Michael's hands and slunk away round the house again. Thank you so much, Mrs. Fairfax said to Michael as they all followed it. He will keep trying to bite Letty's visitor. Inside, she shouted sternly in the front garden, as the collie seemed to be thinking of going round the house and getting to the orchard the other way. The dog gave her a woeful look over its shoulder, and crawled dismally indoors through the porch. That dog may have the right idea, Sophie said. Mrs. Fairfax, do you know who Letty's visitor is? Mrs. Fairfax chuckled. The wizard Pendragon, or Howl, or whatever he calls himself, she said. But Letty and I don't let on, we know. It amused me when he first turned up, calling himself Sylvester Oak because I could see he'd forgotten me, though I hadn't forgotten him, even though his hair used to be black in his student days. Mrs. Fairfax by now had her hands folded in front of her and was standing bolt upright, prepared to talk all day, as Sophie had often seen her do before. He was my old tutor's very last pupil, you know, before she retired. When Mr. Fairfax was alive, he used to like me to transport us both to Kingsbury to see a show from time to time. I can manage too very nicely if I take it slowly. And I always used to drop in on old Mrs. Pence Stemmon while I was there. She likes her old pupils to keep in touch. And one time she introduced this young Howl to us. Oh, she was proud of him. She taught Wizard Solomon too, you know. And she said Howl was twice as good. But don't you know the reputation Howl has? Michael interrupted. Getting into Mrs. Fairfax's conversation 
was rather like getting into a turning skipping rope. You had to choose the exact moment, but once you were in, you were in. Mrs. Fairfax turned herself slightly to face Michael. Most of it's just talk, to my mind, she said. Michael opened his mouth to say that it was not, but he was in the skipping rope then, and it went on turning. And I said to Letty, here's your big chance, my love. I knew how could teach her twenty times more than I could, for I don't mind telling you, Letty's brains go way beyond mine, and she could end up in the same league as the Witch of the Waste, only in a good way. Letty's a good girl, and I'm fond of her. If Mrs. Pence Stemmon was still teaching, I'd have Letty to her tomorrow. But she isn't. So I said, Letty, here's Wizard Howl courting you, and you could do worse than fall in love with him yourself and let him be your teacher. The pair of you will go far. I don't think Letty was too keen on the idea at first, but she's been softening lately, and today it seems to be going beautifully. Here Mrs. Fairfax paused to beam benevolently at Michael, and Sophie dashed into the skipping rope for her turn. But someone told me Letty was fond of someone else, she said. Sorry for him, you mean, said Mrs. Fairfax. She lowered her voice. There's a terrible disability there, she whispered suggestively, and it's asking too much of any girl. I told him so. I'm sorry for him myself. Sophie managed a mystified, Oh, but it's a fearsomely strong spell. It's very sad, Mrs. Fairfax wound on. I had to tell him that there's no way someone of my abilities can break anything that's put on by the Witch of the Waste. Hal might, but of course he can't ask Hal, can he? Here Michael had kept looking nervously to the corner of the house in case Hal came round it and discovered them, managed to trample through the skipping rope and stop it by saying, I think we'd better be going. Are you sure you won't come in for a taste of my honey? asked Mrs. Fairfax. I use it in nearly all my spells, you know. And she was off again, this time about the magical properties of honey. Michael and Sophie walked purposefully down the path to the gate, and Mrs. Fairfax drifted behind them, talking away and sorrowfully straightening plants that the dog had bent as she talked. Sophie, meanwhile, racked her brains for a way to find out how Mrs. Fairfax knew Letty was Letty, without upsetting Michael. Mrs. Fairfax paused to gasp a bit as she heaved a large lupin upright. Sophie took the plunge. Mrs. Fairfax, wasn't it my niece Martha who was supposed to come to you? Naughty girls, Mrs. Fairfax said, smiling and shaking her head as she emerged from the lupin as if I wouldn't recognise one of my own honey-based spells. But as I said to her at the time, I'm not one to keep anyone against their will, and I'd always rather teach someone who wants to learn. Only, I said to her, I'll have no pretense here. You stay as your own self or not at all. And it's worked out very happily, as you see. Are you sure you won't stay and ask her? For yourself. I think we'd better go, Sophie said. We have to get back, Michael added, with another nervous look toward the orchard. He collected the seven-league boots from the hedge and set one down outside the gate for Sophie. And I'm going to hold on to you this time, he said. Mrs. Fairfax leaned over her gate while Sophie inserted her foot in the boot. Seven-leaguers, she said. Would you believe? I've not seen one of those for years. Very useful things for someone your age, Mrs. Er. Uh, I wouldn't mind a pair myself these days. So it's you Letty inherits her witchcraft from, is it? Hmm? Not that it necessarily runs in families, but as often as not. Michael took hold of Sophie's arm and pulled. Both boots came down, and the rest of Mrs. Fairfax's talk vanished in the zip and rush of air. Next moment, Michael had to brace his feet in order not to collide with the castle. The door was open.
Inside, Calcifer was roaring. Port Haven door, someone's been banging on it ever since you left.